Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Black Literature, Black History. This is Jason Williams, and tonight we're going to begin the book Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by Linda Brent, which was actually written by Harriet Jacobs. Linda Brent is her pen name that she published it under. And this book was actually first published in 1861 under the name Linda Brent. Now, we're going to compare some parts of this slave narrative to Frederick Douglass as we read through it because the slave narratives actually brought a new genre of writing to um, American literature. And these are true stories written by the slaves about their own lives. And what's interesting about these books, when you read these books, you should read the introductions, the prefaces, and when there are notes or like there's notes in the appendix, like as you read through these books in various sentences and phrases, they'll have a number next to it, which are called end notes through each chapter. And those are facts and backgrounds behind what the, the slave is actually talking about or what the author is talking about to give you some sort of background or some insight about what's going on because this was written back in 1861. So different words and references that they make may not be familiar to us, so it's really good to read the um, end notes. Also, in these slave narratives, the author doesn't always use the, the true name of some of the people that they reference because they want to keep their secrets, their passages, and the people that help them along the way. They want to keep those names and those people and their families secret. Just like she published her narrative under the name Linda Brent because she wanted to keep her own life. Um, she wanted to keep her own life private also because in the North, even though slaves went North to obtain freedom, there was the Fugitive Slave Act which Southerners and Northerners captured slaves and brought them back into slavery. So, and Linda Brent talks, Linda Brent or Harriet, I'm going to refer to her as Harriet Jacobs, but she references the Fugitive Slave Act in many chapters in this book. And she uses the Fugitive Slave Act to, to let readers know that the slave system and plantations in the South and the racism in the South was just as bad as in the North. Like the North wasn't any better than the South. So I want to kind of say that backwards. We always like to say the, the racism and slavery in the South and they go to the North to be free because Northerners were known. Northerners were just as racist and just as horrible as the whites in the South during that time period. And Harriet Jacobs usually refers to the Northerners in this book as uh, bloodhounds, and we'll get into that later. But when you read this book and you read the, the narrative of Frederick Douglass, you'll notice that before the story, before they get into their stories, they write little prefaces and things like that. And the first thing they want to do is excuse themselves by the read of their deficiencies. And they want to apologize in advance for this and that. And that is not actually apologizing for something that you're going to read where you're going to notice mistakes. It's just, it's a style of writing which they probably picked up because they learn how to read and they learn how to write and they're very, and you can tell from the end notes as you read through these books and you read the end notes that they're very 
voracious readers. They have quotes from the Bible, quotes from different uh, classic poetry, classic literature, you know, so, and in classic literature for a while, it was the style of people to say, you know, before you read this, I just want to apologize in advance. It's some type of courtesy to introduce you to what they're going to write. They say, I apologize for this and I apologize for that, but this is a real account that I wrote, that I experienced, and I'm going to tell you the truth. And actually, Harriet Jacobs, she, throughout the story, sometimes she goes through some things that are kind of horrific. And when she gets through with those horrific details, and she's never as descriptive as Frederick Douglass, but afterwards she says, look, this really happened. You know, don't doubt it is true. I'm not lying to you. And one thing to note in Frederick Douglass's narrative, he figured out his age to be somewhere around 27, 28 years of age. Because when he was born, he didn't have his family with him. So he didn't know how old he was. His father was a white slave master, so he never really knew his father as a father. And his mother used to visit him as a baby, but he didn't really get to know her because she died when he was still a toddler. Harriet Jacobs was born in a actual close family. Her father was married and her mother and her grandmother. And she said that she was enslaved for 27 years. So she won her freedom in, out of slavery at age 27. And she puts this in the preface where she's apologizing. She's like, I apologize for these errors that you're going to see, but I was enslaved for 27 years. So during that time period, you know, I was held back from growing uh, intellectually and I was suffering hardships and I wasn't able to focus to give you the some sort of uh, expertise that you would expect from a writer. However, her writing is very skilled and is very is, is very poetic. There's a lot of prose in here. As we go through this book, I'm going to read certain sections that are just uh, fantastic, and some may surprise you. But in her preface, she also says that she wrote this book specifically for black women in the North to realize that there were women in the South who are still suffering. And she actually gives the number. I'll uh, look it up real quick. She says, it's in her preface. She says, but I do earnestly desire to arouse the women of the North to a realizing sense of the condition of two millions of women at the South still in bondage, suffering what I suffered, and most of them are far worse. I just noticed as I read that that she didn't specifically say black women, but she said women who suffered as I suffered. Black women, is, is, see, they, they, she starts to already erase the racial construct, which back then was actually created in order to uphold white supremacy. These racial constructs, if you read your ancient history books and about the different empires, they don't refer to people of a certain race in bondage or a certain color. They refer to certain nations. You could be Roman, you can be an African, but if you were a Roman citizen, you held the rights of a Roman citizen over slaves of other nations. The racial construct which defines the discourse of American history classified races according to color, therefore they could categorize races, put white at the top, enforce white supremacy in the U.S.
Harriet Jacobs said there's women in the South. I'm writing to women in the North to notify you of women in the South who have suffered as I have suffered. So she points out who she's talking about when she says suffered as I have suffered. Because in the United States, no other race of woman has suffered or has had the same experiences as black women, hands down. And this is good that I'm doing this because recently, Bette Midler quoted a song from John Lennon and Yoko Ono saying that women are the niggers of the world. No, black women have suffered more than any other race of woman in the United States and these slave narratives point that out. And Harriet Jacobs quick to point out that some many suffered worse than she did because when she was born her family was intact. And another thing that she references which can be related to as all women writers of the early period when she was after she won her slavery, she was in the North, she said she had to snatch an hour here, snatch some time here and there outside of her household duties in order to write this narrative. And if you study literature, in, in Europe, they didn't want women to be writers back in the early days. So a lot of women had pen names of men but the hardship that women had in writing was, was that they had to do their womanly duties in the house before writing. So many women would stay up at the wee hours of the night and write their books, write their literature. And the same thing is true of Harriet Jacobs. She had to do her womanly duties first. She had to keep the household. And then when she got time, she would write down her story, and very eloquently so. Now, it's very interesting, in the first chapter, her very first sentence, she said, I was born a slave. And that's very important. And it becomes a line in all of the slave narratives in the very beginning to say, I was born a slave, but I wanted to point out that the very second sentence in this narrative, her very second sentence begins, my father was a carpenter. And then she talks about her father because her father was a very important man in her life. She knew who her father was and her father worked as a carpenter and he actually earned money and he tried to save up all the money that he could. He, he was a skilled carpenter that traveled from different plantation to plantation to do work and his slave masters let him keep some of the money that he made and she said that he was saving up to buy the freedom of his children which he never accomplished. But we're going to stick to the first chap, a lot of the first chapter here, because in the following chapters, you're going to see how proud her father was and how proud she was of, of her father. But the thing about him wanting to buy his children's freedom, her maternal grandmother, because Harriet Jacobs' mother died when she was, when Harriet Jacobs was six years old, and we're going to come back to that, but she was kind of raised by her maternal grandmother, who also baked for a living and tried to save up money to buy the freedom of her grandkids and her own kids, but she couldn't secure the freedom of her own kids because they were spread out among different plantations as these mistresses and masters of the houses died, they would distribute the slaves to, to save money. And there was an instance where 
Harriet Jacobs' grandmother had $300 saved, which she was trying to use to purchase the freedom of her relatives, and her mistress was low on money and sort of asked the grandmother if she could loan her $300, promising to pay it back. And of course, you know, as a slave, as, as a black woman in the South, she loaned her the money and she never got the money back because at that time her grandmother was a slave and whites didn't have to keep any promises that they made to the slaves because the slaves were property. And um, uh, in the first chapter, Harriet Jacobs also points out that her family was of a lighter complexion of brown and they were termed mulattoes. So this different color scheme and colorism, which we call now, like this is not an example of colorism, but, you, but her pointing out the different complexions of slaves and being termed mulattoes shows that this, that that, uh, those references in the black community were already being recognized and of some importance. If it wasn't of any importance at all, they would never point it out. Harriet Jacobs pointed it out. Frederick Douglass pointed it out. But they didn't point that out to show that there was separate, like slaves were dividing themselves according to their slave, according to their color, which that fake uh, letter, Jim Crow letter, whatever that fake letter is called, they talk about the slave, the slave master made sure that there were light-skinned slaves and dark-skinned slaves so they would pit against each other. No, that Jim Crow letter is false. They were pointing out these differences in color in mulattoes and biracial stuff to show that these slave masters and mistresses were raping these slaves. And you will, and Frederick Douglass pointed out how the biracial slaves, mostly of the slave master, had it very hard on the plantation because number one, the mistress couldn't stand them because her husband was having sex with the slave. So there was hate there. He would have children that would many times look like his own white children, and they would have some form of blood kinship which wouldn't be tolerated so many times the biracial kids of the slave master were sold off the plantation or treated very badly to reinforce to that slave even though you're my son as a master you still are a slave and now the only thing I'm going to see you as as a slave and they treated them a lot harsher as Frederick Douglass pointed out, in many occasions than the other slaves. And Harriet Jacobs, later as we get into the story, she's going to tell how her light, lighter complexion and stuff worked against her on the slave plantations as she grew older. But she, re she references her childhood, and as a child, she didn't know she was a slave. And Frederick Douglass, when he referenced his childhood, he didn't know that he was a slave. So as children, they were treated, you know, just, they couldn't, when they were too small to do any work, they really didn't, didn't bother the children that much. And uh, Frederick Douglass says his, as a child, he would, was happy even though he wore rags and stuff like that. And Harriet Jacobs says when she had a happy childhood. And when her mother died, her mother's mistress promised her to Harriet Jacobs' mother that her children would suffer for nothing. So, and want for nothing, not would suffer for nothing, but they would want for nothing. So she, so Linda Brent, or Harriet Jacobs, was still happy even though when her mother died and she loved to serve her mistress 
because she said her mistress treated her well. However, when her mistress died, her Harriet Jacobs thought, well, since she's such a nice lady and cared for us, she's going to free us in her will. Like in the slave papers that I read in my family, the slave master in, in my family's uh, papers has said if they behave for the next three years, Jack should be free. That was in my slave papers. So Harriet Jacobs thought that her mistress, since she was so nice, was going to free her and upon her death. But when her mistress's will was read out and she wasn't free, Harriet Jacobs was upset and she did not forgive her and she resented her even though her mistress treated her well. Her mistress taught her how to read, how to write and everything. But all of that is for naught and doesn't mean anything without freedom and she actually says, as a child, I loved my mistress, and looking back on the happy days I spent with her, I try to think with less bitterness of this act of injustice. So she says, I try to think with less bitterness, which means that she was very bitter and without freedom, she doesn't forgive. And there's going to, you're going to see many occasions where Harriet Jacobs will say, well, this seemed okay and this seemed okay, but as a slave, it doesn't matter. Give me my freedom. That's all that I'm worried about. If you don't give me my freedom, all of these little acts of kindness, that's, they do that for themselves. They don't do it for the slave as long as you remain a slave. So we're still in the chapter one of this book. When I first started reading it before doing these presentations, I was reading through the whole book, but there's a lot of information that she's given in each chapter. So we want to walk through this uh, chapter by chapter. If there are certain chapters that don't have such a wealth of information, we're going to keep going. But so far we're in chapter one and I'm going to come back to you I'm going to try to, I know I've been going for a while, but I'm going to try to make sure that I give a weekly YouTube pages and notifications. Incidents in the life of a slave girl, Harriet Jacobs, and we're going to continue next week or in a couple of days with uh, chapter two. Again, this is Jason Williams with Black Literature, Black History. Have a nice evening.